<laughs> anyway, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I can tell by the list of participants that we still have some stragglers to join us. Um, while we're waiting on those for a minute, uh, I'm going to quickly let you guys in on a little secret. Um, there aren't any photos or aren't, there aren't very many photos yet. But uh, we've put some of our tastings for January up on the website, um, including, and where am I here? This one, I want to make sure I share the right thing. Blinded by Bourbon. So Evan and Harmony are back with a tasting concept that might have been beaten with a dead, like a dead horse or whatever. But I mean, when it works, it works. Um, yeah, and we promise to not do more than one rye per bourbon tasting. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> In in the defense of the KWM whiskey staff, I think when we say bourbon, we mean American whiskey, but terminology can be important and or crucial. Um, we've got a Glenn Farkless family cast tasting coming up with Deborah Stewart. This is a virtual tasting. Um, six S22 releases and an S18 or W18, sorry, 1983. It's, what was the total there? I think I put it on, can't read it just at this moment. 180. 180 years of Glenn Farkless. There you go. Thanks, Harmony. Um, there's some wine stuff in store, some other things coming up. Hollyrood, Hollywood Whiskey is launching in Canada. Rob Carpenter and Callum Ray are going to be doing a tasting in store January 24th. Uh, January 25th, we would normally have our Burns Festival that night. It's going to be on the next night because uh, Lily from Elixir Distillers is in town and we're going to launch the Macbeth range from Elixir Distillers. So that's going to be a cool in-store tasting. We will also be doing a virtual version of that eventually, but it hasn't been scheduled. But this one is most definitely in person. For those in the Calgary area or willing to travel, the Burns Bash, uh, Robbie Burns Festival will be January 26th this year. Um, and yeah, there's some other stuff too coming up. There's a Doc Swinson's cast coming, so there's going to be a launch. There'll be a few more tastings sprinkled out in the next few days. Um, we're still trying to dot all our I's and cross all our T's and such. Um, but yeah, that's, what's exciting. And yeah, other than that, Harmony's with me tonight. James is with me. He just showed up early and we co-opted him into co-hosting the tasting with us. So for those who don't know, James born from authentic wine spirits, um, at least one cask in this lineup by quick math came through his hands. So it kind of seems appropriate, but we should probably dive in guys. Um, so we've got eight whiskeys tonight. This tasting came about because we had sort of a surge of late 2023 single cask arrivals, plus a daft mill. So it only made sense to put on a tasting and that's why we're all here. Um, so we're gonna start off with the daft mill. Um, the order it was in the chat in the waiting room. If you don't have it, I'll put it in the chat once more. Oops, that's not the right set of text. That's the description of tonight's tasting that I had to post on Facebook because Evan forgot to. Um, here, this is what you want. That's the order. Starting with the Daft Mill, Boutique Speyside, Whiskey Sponge, Gordon McPhail, Calvin Aaron Amr Kilholman. That should do us well. Um, Slange, everybody. So starting off with Daft Mill, this is the 2010 winter batch release. We just launched this, I think about a month ago, maybe a little over a month ago. Put her up on the old screen there. Um, <clears throat> I should say, before we get too far tonight, I am gonna be leaning on James and Harmony a bit because uh, I am just recovering from the COVID. And although I think my palate is medium good, it is definitely not at its best right now. I can definitely smell things that smell similar to what I believe they're like, but. There's some weird off notes on my palate right now that I think are virus related. So uh, anyway, what do we have here? Quite creamy, um, distillate driven, loads of barley, which is your typical daft mill notes. Mm -hmm. uh, creamy, fresh, a lot of white fruit, apple and pear. Yeah. A bit of cheesiness. Yeah, there's some nice grasses. To me, it was like uh, creamy, grassy pears mm -hmm. right off the bat. James? Yeah, a little bit of that kind of apple Jolly Rancher. I don't know. Do you remember that 23-year-old um, Altavin uh, boutique, the one with the cows on the front? Yes. It smelled exactly insane. like this whiskey. Oh, good call. And that one was 23 years old, which I feel like is a good uh, vote of confidence for this staff mill. Yeah, it's it's punching above its age. 
Um, I believe it's a 12 year old, 12 or 13, somewhere in that range. Um, what about the palate, you guys? Big, malty, fruity, waxy. Yeah, I feel like it's a little bit more lush than I usually expect from, from Daft Mill, but in a good way. Yeah. Yeah, the waxiness, I think, is a good call. Like, it does have a nice floral, waxy base to it. Yeah. Um, and soft melatones. Slightly less oaky than Ooh. the 15. Yeah. 15 was quite dominated by the cask, I felt. This was just a really nice, yeah. youthful no. spirit, but drinking above its age, as you said. One thing that strikes me about this, you know when you taste whiskey from a glass that has clearly been washed in someone's dishwasher and it just smells kind of like the soap? <laughs> like, I, I only clean my glassware with steam at home. Um, you know, maybe my days in the in the restaurant business, I'm a bit anal about that. But I find daft mail often when you just initially knows it, it smells like there's soap in the glass almost. <laughs> it's like that weird mix of kind of the, the cheesiness and the floral notes. I think I can see that on the palate. Like it does taste like a little bit of dishwasher residue. Yeah. Um, interesting note. I like, so I've got a glass dishwasher in my bar. Um, I do a wash cycle and then I do a, uh, a rinse cycle afterwards. And I find that that makes a big difference, but yeah. Um, detergents can spoil a lot of things much as perfumes and Axe deodorant body sprays and colognes can also ruin things. So, um, but anyway, uh, so for those of you who don't know Daff Mill, um, Lowland Distillery, uh, very small, run by a farmer. Um, it's been operating since 20, 2005, so opened the same year as Kilholman, but they didn't release anything until 2012, or yeah, until they were 12 years age, about 2017. Um, he's a very funny guy. He had an assistant once, but I don't think they did things quite the way he wanted them to. So he does like literally all the work himself. He farms half the year, distills the other half the year. Um, and yeah, the whole thing was born out of this idea that he wanted to add value to the crops that he and his brother were producing because they felt some years they weren't getting paid enough for their barley. So they said, how can we add value to our own barley? And they, they opened a distillery. And bizarrely, they have never needed anyone's money. They did it all themselves. Um, granted, they, their production has always been quite small, but... Uh, yeah, it's just a fascinating, almost anti-business. It's a kind of 18th century approach to business. And, you know, I think it works for them because they sell everything they make and uh, they do things the way they want to and they don't need to change it. And yeah. Where does he get his malting done? Uh, it's not far okay. away. It's, an, it's a maltsters that's, uh, I think, in the lowlands, not far from him. So... There, he's pretty close to St. Andrews would be like the major tourist center near him. And I'm pretty sure like it's, it's trucked not very far, but that's one of the details I love about this distillery is the practicality of it. It's a farmer's approach to everything. He only malts as much as like a rational number of truckloads worth of deliveries to and from the distillery makes sense. So like, he doesn't like to have a surplus of barley and he'll make as much whiskey as he has barley to make based on the truckloads that he gets at the times of years he needs it. He fills the casks that he gets from the Speyside Cooperage, not, that's not far from him. There's a, a port where they arrive in. He fills his horse trailer with the casks and only as many casks as he can get in the horse trailer at a time. And I think he, the guys at Speyside Cooperage probably love this eccentric farmer that shows up with his horse trailer. They actually let him hand pick the casks he wants. Almost all their other customers, I'm sure, don't care. They just want a hundred bourbon barrels. They don't care what each of the nose is like. And I just have this view of him like in his overalls, his like yeah. boiler suit, walking around, nosing the cask that he's gonna pick and load into <laughs> his truck. Like it's just everything is based on like, you know, uh sort of limitations that he's set based on practical reasons not based on theoretical outputs and time and production. Like it's, it's it for, for him, it's about quality. Like he probably does one distilling run a day, seven days a week for six months a year. And he produces something like 20 to 30,000 liters as a result. And uh, yeah, the guy is, the guy's crazy. He works like 16 to 18 hours a day for seven days a week for like months. 
then he probably does the same thing when he's farming. But uh, yeah. Have you ever noticed, Andrew, his website is hosted on WordPress, which I feel yeah. like is so perfect. Yeah, like he doesn't need to do more than that. Like he, he I, I went to visit him last year. I was lucky to spend a couple hours with him, just like constantly asking him questions. And I think at the end of the couple hours, like he was ready for me to leave. And that was when it was time to go. Cause like he'd given me some time as his exclusive retailer in Canada. He'd given me a couple hours of his time graciously. And once that was done, he was, he needed to get back to making whiskey. So yeah, I, I have a lot of respect for that. You know, in some ways, it's sort of like the craziness of Springbank that a lot of us love, where like, you know, for the longest time, they were beholden to like 19th century business principles, but we kind of loved their craziness. So we put up with it. And I think it's kind of a similar example. He's an incredibly eccentric, but interesting person who happens to make great whiskey. So yeah, Daft Mill. Um, all right, Speyside, Boutique Speyside. <clears throat> this is the cast they had to talk us into, if I'm being honest. Um, like we get sent offer sheets from them and there's, they frequently have good stuff. The biggest problem we have is just that like, you know, sometimes it's hard to get people excited about 500 mil bottles and 500 mil bottles with non-traditional labels on them. And, you know, that's coming from a store that probably has the most non-traditional labeled whiskey bottles of any store in the country. And, you know, we struggle with it because, you know, people don't know what to make of them. I personally love the bottles. I think a lot, most of the whiskeys are excellent, but I get it. Like you can't force people to buy something they don't want. Um, what's the frustrating part for me though, is when they try it and they know it's good and you show them how they're priced reasonably, but they still don't want it because of, you know, 500 mil bottle or funny labels. And I suppose that strength this has against it, Andrew, being 24 versus 25. That's like the scarlet mm -hmm. letter of whiskey. It It <laughs> is. But like, yeah, I mean, no, what I was getting into was just the boutique -y in general, like the hard, hard, how hard it is to get people excited about the boutique -y ballings because of their appearance and their size. This one's actually done pretty well because it's a 24 year old single malt and granted 500 mil bottle at $175. Like you just don't see that anymore. But even better than that, like this is just a beautiful, like almost entirely distillate driven, fruity, waxy, floral, single malt, probably Glenlivet. And it's frankly excellent. Um, but they had to talk us into it. I saw it on the sheet. I was like, yeah, that's a pretty good price for a mystery 24 year old space side. But like it was not enough to get me hooked. And they finally, like, basically the agent and then they, they, they sent us a sample. And I was like, we tried. I was like, okay, yeah, that's actually pretty good. We should probably buy that. But part of it was like, you know, we see it. Like, our customers aren't as excited. A lot of them aren't as excited about these bottles as maybe I am especially. Yeah. But this, this particular bottling, man, is such good value. Harmony? There are definitely good bottles of boutique out there. And I try to just encourage people that, you know, just to remind them that whiskey is for drinking. So it may be a smaller bottle, but just drink it, move on and try another one. Yeah. Um, but I find a lot of the time people just get excited about that boutique bottle of a distillery that we don't see a lot of like long morn for example sure. if you don't see a lot of long morn and you definitely don't see a lot of independent jura so those kind of seem to get more people excited but um when i poured when evan and i poured this for people um at the festival or at events around the city people got pretty excited about it and Yes, it's not 25 years, James, but it's, uh, it's, I think the price is very fair for what they're offering. Yeah. I wish that whiskey shops were just filled with whiskeys just like this. Yeah. Like that would be my dream. Like it's, it just checks so many boxes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but maybe I think we're just kind of a bit of a niche. I don't know. I don't know what it yeah. is. One. Well, and I mean, that's that, that in itself is also a fair point. Um, you know, as a retailer, and I've talked about this before, we have to be really careful not to pick casks just because we like them, but we have to pick things that people are going to like because there's a yeah. 
there's the business side of the equation too, but. Well, Andrew, how would someone go into this whiskey? Like what would be their critique? Like there's nothing to critique here. Yeah. Other than I mean, the 500 mil. Yeah. Like they're, you're right. There's not, I mean, this is, uh, this is like a quintessential old school, old, like oxidized space side style single malt. I mean, it's, it is so easily, it's so easy drinking. It's elegant, uh, fruity, you know, I don't think you can, um, but it's one of those things where like, there's just, there's people that have, uh, kind of mental roadblocks or yeah. maybe they've got a whiskey stereotype where like for them, it's important what the bottle looks like on the bar. And if that's the case, like, I still think this would look pretty damn cool on your bar staring out. Oh, amongst nice. There's an eye on it for God's sake, a glowing red eye. Yeah. Is it, is it a Lord of the Rings reference or what's no, this, is, there? this is actually a 2001 space odyssey reference. I'm glad you asked that because if you zoom in closely, it says, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid you can't name that. So, and then an even smaller print, it says Kensington Wine Market. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an oddity bottling for sure. There's not a lot of them. So this one for us made sense. It's 24 years old. It'll be gone in a couple of months um, just because it was a small outturn and it's a good price point. And like, I think a third of it's already sold. So, mm -hmm. but it is a broader comment on the boutique thing and I've talked to them about it. I think in some markets that format works. I don't know, maybe if you're living in London and you got to carry everything home with you on the tube, it makes sense like that. You know, but in places like Canada where you're driving everywhere in your giant truck, like you don't care. <laughs> An extra 200 mils isn't going to make a difference. You're driving at home anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah. I would have an extra closet in my house though, if all of my bottles were smaller. Yeah. But right now I don't, but yeah. no, I love the flavor profile and I I'm getting some waxiness on this as well that I wasn't expecting. Um, But tons of fruit, my goodness. It's so mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes these old um, American oak aged whiskeys, like you get the vanilla and the coconut and the cream, but so sometimes it can be boring in that sense, but you just hope for like that little bit of magic fruit that kind mm -hmm. of is in balance. And when it's there, yeah. like that's when it's so lovely. And this really has that, like well, it just is... kind of diverges it into like its own unique little space. Yeah. 47.8%. Um, like this is, kind of a dangerously easy drinking bottle. Like this is yeah. a bottle where I could see, a, I've got a buddy in particular. I could take a bottle of this over to his house and we could play pinball and there would be no bottle left in a couple of hours. Am I so, that buddy? Um, well, do you have four pinball machines in your basement? I'll buy one on Amazon right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I've got to get my wife over there for a visit and hopefully we can acquire a pinball machine because uh, it is a lot of fun. It is a great way to spend time. Um, anyway, that's the boutique space side 24 year. Uh, one of our most recent casks and one that I'm I'm a big fan of. Um, it it also does speak to a style of whiskey. And I think this segues into the next one too, that uh I really love, which is that refill American oak, um oxidized tropical sort of whiskeys and uh, it might not be a tropical fruit bomb, but it's kind of verging in that direction. And, and that's what I love about it. Um, Cam Cam comments that he really likes the small 500 mil bottles. I wish more distilleries offered it. I like to try lots of stuff, but don't need full bottles. Um, maybe it's the weird inconsistent labels. You know what? It could be that, Cam. I mean, because their branding, I actually think on a lot of things is great. Um, but the problem is every single one is unique. And then... To your point, there's no consistency. So how do you build it up? You know, I think, again, and this segues a little bit into the next one, which is the whiskey sponge. I think that's one of the reasons why, and granted, it's not the size issue with these. Maybe these guys are getting away with these labels a bit more is there is a bit of a tie in with them. Like that sponge character appears in a lot of them. There is a bit of a, a synergy, whereas the, the boutique ones are frankly, each of them is its own story completely independent of all the others and um maybe that makes it harder to to tell a narrative uh all right we are on to the sponge craigulicky also known as the walter bottling um 
So backstory on this one is we were offered a couple of really gorgeous casks by Angus and one of them really stood out and it was this Craig Illichy. And he said, what do you want to do with the label? Like we can customize it a little bit, make it personalized. And I said, uh, you know, Craig Illichy's famous for its worm tub. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's like essentially a big vat outside the distillery where the con condensation takes place in a giant copper tube in this, this, this big vat. Um, instead of the shell and tube kind of condensers that you see inside most distilleries. Uh, so I had this idea, I said, hey, what about if it's me and the Kensington whiskey team sitting in the worm tub as if it's a hot tub? And he's like, that sounds like a good idea, but how many people are on the whiskey team? And I was like, I don't know, maybe six. And he said, nah, it's not gonna work. I have to pay 200 pounds per face to the illustrator. I said, all right, new plan. How about you just put my dog and I on the label? Yep. And so that's how I have a daughter, but the dog so, is it's like I have a daughter, but this dog is way more cool. She she left the business to pursue bigger things. And uh, Walter comes to work more frequently than she does. So especially now that he's kicked out of daycare. So there's Walter and I in the worm tub at Craig Illichy, uh being served by the sponge himself. Uh, this is a 2003 vintage 20-year-old Craig Illichy bottled at 53.4%. Um, the interesting thing about this one is, and it didn't occur to me until, thank God I had the foresight and ego to put myself on the label, but I was looking for, for 20th anniversary bottlings, things from 2003 or 20 years old to mark my 20th anniversary. And I didn't even realize that I'd brought this one in. Um, yeah, the other thing about it, and I, it was unfortunate because I, I don't think the bottle shot, which is a great shot that Sean took, but it doesn't really do the label its full justice. Um, I love how they captured Walter's personality. He's got a wary look on him and, uh, yeah, it was, it was spot on. So anyway, this was a lot of fun. This just came in, uh, and this is an interesting Craig Illichy because you can, I think you can get a little bit of that sort of classic meaty, like faintly sulfury style, but not really. This is more like lush, waxy, classic, like 20 year old refill barrel whiskey. So um, Harmony, I'm gonna start with you. Any thoughts? I know I know your palate's not at its best today, but it's probably still slightly better than mine. Yeah, I love this uh, spirit. I love the weight of it. Um, it's definitely waxy and fruity. It has this almost like um like a oily, nutty character if you've had like macadamia nuts or something, but just like that nutty note to it. Um, I love the fruit. I, I love the cast that it was in. It just it imparted enough flavor that it doesn't cover up the spirit. And it was just like the perfect vessel. For me, this is one of my favorite of our eight in this of our fall casks, as I call them. Cool. Yeah. Thoughts? You have, yeah, usually anytime I uh, get into Craig Elk, first thing I think, I think it's corked. Mm -hmm. But but they never are. Yeah. It, it kind of like blows off a little bit. Yeah, the wet dog, wet cardboard. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel like they always, especially on the nose, they kind of veer right on the line of, you know, they can go on one side, which is like, you know what, it's just a bit too weird. But if they if they ride that other side, it's it's exciting. Yeah. No, it's yeah. it's an underrated distillery. And I know, I think Kevin, was it Kevin here? Someone commented this is their first ever yeah. Kremilicky, which is surprising. I mean, um, we've talked about this in other tastings. Um, the distillery bottled 13 and 17. I think are great whiskeys and the 13, especially for the price. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not currently on sale, it'll be on sale tomorrow because we just got some in at a discount again, but like it, it's a great distillery. I don't think it always gets um, a lot of attention because it was, you know, I don't know what tier we'd slot it into, but it's probably third or fourth tier in terms of consumer awareness. And I don't think that's because of quality. The distillery bottlings are 46%, natural color. They don't hide from any of that shit. And they're, frankly, their labels are fucking awesome. 
Like I love the label on that 13 year. I think it's just oh, fun. Me too. Yeah. Um, I love the yellow. It just stands Well, you know out. who designed that label, right, Andrew? The whole Bacardi range? It was Stranger Stranger. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, they, they nailed it. I mean, to be yeah, every honest. Every Bacardi package is awesome. Well, I don't I don't know that I love much of the rest of the bottling design. The, the Altmore's have been, I mean, we never see Altmore, but like, yeah. I don't know that I love Aberfeldy. Um, Brackla and Brackla and the Deverin are a little too grandpa's whiskey-ish for me in terms of their approach. The Deverin but, looks like it belongs in a picnic basket. Which one? The Deverin. The Deverin, yeah. <laughs> What is a Deverin? That's the, the problem is no one knows what a Deverin is, I think is yeah. the problem. But that's a whole different story. Um, yeah, the Craig Illicky pa packaging is excellent, but the quality on the whiskey on this is is superb. Yeah. Andrew, I will let you know because you're going to hear me talking about this, but I refer to this whiskey as the Andrew and Walter hot tub water. Mm -hmm. well, and it's still I mean, there's a funk. So. There's a little bit of funk on it, so... Maybe that's the. It's not one. full on wet dog though. So the quirkiness <laughs> that James is. Have you gotten about. any weird questions in the store about this one? Please tell me someone has. You know. Uh, well, I, James, why don't I? I personally haven't. So why don't you ask me a weird question? <laughs> if you have one in mind. Did, well, <laughs> I don't know. Someone probably looks at that and thinks that a dog has actually, you know, been in the vat. Like people don't necessarily know that whiskey ages in like a sealed container. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that sort of comes up, to, but even that, I mean, it comes up to my my point that I made to you or made made in a previous tasting about about Springbank and my favorite story about Springbank. And when I went there for it was my third ever distillery tour, and I was appalled because there was mouse shit everywhere and it was filthy. And the the distillery guy, Kate, looked at me like I was stupid when I said, like, aren't you worried that there's mice? She's like, fuck no, as long as we have mice, we know we don't have rats. Like anything that gets through fermentation, which is like practically nothing because it's a zero oxygen environment, is not going to survive distillation. Like it's it's not like finding a dead mouse in your beer. Like that's a problem because there's a dead mouse in your beer. But like if a mouse fell into the wash during fermentation, like that's a rounding error in the flavor profile of the spirit. Like. And it's not going to like give you any, there's not going to be any germs or anything left behind. The bacteria is going to destroy it or the, the yeast rather. Is that an immune booster then? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We, uh, we have a new front desk person at our office. We of course share office, office with Chardon Hobbs, the art bag and, you know, Glenmo people. Anyways, she saw a mouse in the office and she caught it with like a Tupperware or something and flushed it live down the toilet. What? That that actually happened like two days ago. I mean, it's brutal. I'm impressed. A lot of people I know would not have been able to catch it. Uh, <laughs> but are you suggesting a... she should have dispatched it first, or or she? Should... I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, James. It sounds like you're haunted by this. I mean, and I get it. It's. I feel like it'd be better if I'd been there and just you know, let her do her thing. But when you just hear the story secondhand, there's too much room for imagination. Yeah, it maybe <laughs> builds up the person in your mind. So uh, as like, they what, rest what else is this person capable of? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Watch it, James. Watch your best. <laughs> hey, but I bet don't she, I bet she knows Sam how to handle the callers. <laughs> Gonna say, yeah, don't we get go a lot of phone calls at our to... office for things like, well, we used to get phone calls from Pappy Van Winkle, Spay yeah. Mall, Michter's 10, those types of things. And uh, yeah, it's it's a much more, it's it's definitely a shift in in the tone of those conversations in the last month. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, anyway, that's the Glen Talkers. Hope you guys like that one. And I mean, we do encourage you to save a little bit in the glass because we will come back around for what we call the speed rounds, where we go back through just to see how things change and evolve in the glass. But um, we need to move on to the Glen Talkers. And James, I don't know if you maybe want to start us off on this because um, I mean, we've been, we've obviously had a, a long relationship with Gordon McPhail, but in the, the years since Authentic took over, you and I have been working a lot together, especially on uh, um, single casks and, 
There have not been many, I think there's been exactly two Gordon McPhail cask samples that we didn't jump on because um, they keep teeing up some incredible stuff. Yeah, no, for sure. So yeah, I mean, we get a list of casts every year. It's not a very long list. And then the U.S. gets a list. And, you know, the, the amount of places in the U.S. that will bottle an entire cask like this, actually, there's not very many. So, you know, sometimes I see what k Wine Merchants is getting. And, you know, for those that uh, travel in the U.S., like, mm -hmm. they they took a 12-year-old peated Buna from Firstville Sherry, which you can imagine how that would land in Alberta. And a the sister cast to your um, Sherry Kleinleash. Mm -hmm. so, and they got both of them. <laughs> yeah. So what often happens in the U.S. is is casts like this Glen Talkers kind of float around and mm -hmm. people see what K&L has and they're like, oh, I'll pass on this. But often the price and there's let's just say there's some gems. Yeah. These these whiskeys are analyzed blind in the lab at g &M. So. You know, they don't know if this is, they don't know what distillery it is, but it gets scored. And if it scores high enough, it gets coughed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, <laughs> I mean, I think we've seen more of this in the time since they switched from the old Connoisseur's Choice line, which was not always single casks. It was often batches. Now everything is a single cast. I mean... They've got various markets around the world that'll probably get not an exclusive, but it, it's effectively an exclusive because they're taking like quantities of, of, of particular bottlings. They might bottle eight or 10 of these Glen Talkers from 2006, like depends on how many they have. Um, but yeah, the quality of them, the, of the samples that we've been getting has been high. And for a 16 year old at 58.8%, like the price on this is frankly excellent. This kind of also strikes me as kind of a sweet spot for Glen Talkers in terms of like cast type, profile. Like if, if you kind of painted, like I'm I'm sure you you remember some of those older Glen Talkers. I mean that 79 was good, but mm -hmm. um, but like that 1990 sherried one, sometimes when they get too old, they actually, you know, they have a tough time holding up. Yeah. But at this age, it, it shows lovely. Yeah. It Glen Talkers to me, I I think Glen Talkers is a whiskey that it 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 can mature longer, but I think sherry, there's a time limit on it. Like unless it's refill, it just can't hang on with like big sherry for too long. If it's refill bourbon, like you can go 40, 50 years. Like it's that's no problem. Um, even first fill, like some of Gordon McPhail's first fill barrels don't seem over oaked. So they seem to work too. But uh yeah, I mean this is for a 15 year old, this is so delicate on the palate at 58.8%, the alcohol, you can barely feel it. The nose is floral, fruity, nutty, mm. um, big, again, nutty, toasty tones on the palate, but it's, it's elegant. I mean, this is one that I think will probably be a harder sell for us for a little while, just because it's, if it was young and sherried, even if it wasn't as good as this, it'd be gone because it's young mm. and sherried and there's an yeah, element of be 40 more dollars about that yeah but it's yeah it's an excellent whiskey at 150 bucks i mean maybe things will change but even moving forward like that this is a pretty damn good price for a 16 year old single malt yeah i really yeah. like this one it's so melon forward and then you get those nice bright citrus fruits that just like mm -hmm. keep you salivating um yeah it's it's a very pretty whiskey yeah, this strikes me as one of those casts that if it was left to go a little bit deeper, it would really get that intense, like, um, like candy flavor, like yeah. rock candy. Right? It's on the verge, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, to me, it, it's re reminiscent of, uh, uh, I had this like surrogate grandmother who made, like, they shouldn't call them cinnamon buns, but they were sticky buns. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me of her sticky buns, which were like these white doughy, faintly cinnamon rolls with raisins and then this really nice icing on top this just reminds me of, of sweetie cinnamon bun or like sticky buns rather mm -hmm. pretty elegant um i mean it is what it is it's a 16 year old single malt um it's a little warm but it's not sharp it's not rough 
and it's like very, very fruity, especially on the finish. Um, I love Glen Talkers. It's part of the trio of the Ballantines distilleries in the Chivas portfolio with uh, Glen Berge and Milton Duff. Um, you know, and thank God that like G and M filled their own casks of this because uh, if they hadn't, all we would have is what the other independent bottlers have, which is always refill. And mm -hmm. sometimes we're lucky to get sherry or first fill bourbon as opposed to just refill. But uh, this is a great one. Refill X bourbon, 58.8% and 150 dollarinos. Which takes us on to the next one. Anything else you guys want to add to that before we move on? No, I'm just happy that we are not just doing a full lineup of sherry bombed whiskeys because I like the refills and the bourbon. So I'm, I'm reading into that that maybe that's a hint at the uh, a possible future Glen Talkers cask that may or may not have been loaded into a uh, container earlier this week. Yeah, we 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 do have a sherry Glen Talkers coming, but it's old. Well, it's nice being here, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm um, I'm trying with the sherry. I'm just sick of like the hype of if it's dark, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, there's different people that come to the come to whiskey for different reasons, and really? um, some of them might stay, some of them won't. Uh, you know, we try to cater to the people that are there to explore and find new and fun and different things because, um, you know. My staff know this with beer. Um, I'm very particular about my beer, but I almost never want the same thing twice, which makes me like a very impossible person to please. Because um, <laughs> I want a West Coast IPA circa 15 years ago, um, and I don't want to try the same thing twice. So it's impossible. I think, I think we discovered last month that you actually only like one West Coast IPA. <laughs> Well, well, it depends. Well, well, I was wrong to think that I might like Nipahs again. I'm still over Nipahs. Yeah. Nipahs are dead. So <laughs> to me anyway. All right. Cavalan. This is my second time tasting this Cavalan tonight, actually. Um, I did the uh, Cavalan Masterclass in Banff with Ann Ho, and it was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Did they pour this at that? Uh, not this cask, obviously, oh, but... Okay. Uh, because they had their own Banff Experience Bridge and Oak cast. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. It's Mucho Dollarino. It is Mucho Dollarino. I will drink the sample I paid for, and that is all. Yeah. yeah there you go. Um, so this is an Oloroso Sherry cask. Uh, we were uh, kind of lucky. Um, you know, we... Uh, we're, we're good friends with Jay Wheelock and at that time, Fontana Beverage, when they launched Cavalan in Canada about 10 years ago. And Kensington had about a three month exclusive on Cavalan because of those connections and that relationship. And I've been a fan of their whiskey ever since. Um, it's not always been an easy sell. One of my favorite stories involves a blind tasting I did the first time we had vino in the store. And I did a shirt, like effectively a sherry bombs tasting and it was blind. Um, I didn't tell anyone what any of the whiskeys were and I made them vote before I told them anything about any of the whiskeys as, as you have to. And there was a table of older Scottish gentlemen, like they were in their sixties and this is going back about a decade. One of them might've been English, but three of them were definitely Scottish. And of all the whiskeys and there was a Macallan in the lineup, there was probably a Glendronic. There was all kinds of like big sherried whiskeys in the lineup. And I actually, it wasn't even a sherried whiskey. I put the Cavalan Vino in the lineup. I sort of snuck it in there. And uh, everyone in the tasting, except for one person, picked the Vino as their favorite whiskey. All four of those British guys picked the Vino as their favorite whiskey. And when I revealed to them what it was, that it was a Taiwanese single malt, they were not surprised, they were angry. They actually accused me of lying to them. They're like, you faked this. There's no way that this is Taiwanese whiskey. And I'm like, no, this is, why would I do that? Like, and in some ways they proved my point. This was far more entertaining to get such a visceral response to it. But, you know, it's been a great whiskey for 10 years when it was first in the market at three years of age. It's still a great whiskey. I love that we got to do our own Oloroso Sherry cask. 
I love that it's cheaper than the regular Oloroso sherry by about $32. Um, <laughs> that one snuck under some. As an agent, that, that makes me flinch. Mid. Well, it doesn't happen often, James. That does not happen often. But man, um, it's good. It's rich, fruity, spicy. But it's not just the sherry tones that are there. Like, like some Cavalans, especially the bourbon ones, you can really see those tropical tones start to creep in. And I think you can get those from under the sherry in this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it's a multi-dimensional, multi-layered whiskey. And yeah, awesome to have, finally have our own Solus Cherry Cask. Absolutely. I was trying to convince them to track down that Vina Barique that we toasted live on our virtual and give us that cask too but oh Larry, Larry says he can't find it it's probably too young that's that's yeah. it's only been a couple of years I know well we could just mark it you know just kwm and let just it sit. It in the corner yeah find it for, I mean it won't be that long it'll only be like four more years yeah to get to the six-year-old but yeah James what are your thoughts on this one well first of all anyone who's a rum drinker should be directed towards this I mean yeah. it definitely has a little bit of that acetone on the nose um, but yeah, just like tons of that kind of like fudgy texture up front that Cavalon is so good at. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, I actually think it drinks hotter than 52%. That's, that's one of my comments about this. It, it, it almost drinks hotter than the Glen Talkers at 58, but sometimes that's Cavalon, right? Like sometimes if you add water, it kind of tones, right. it really will tone that down. But I mean, that's probably age, right? Like, so yeah. I have an I have an interesting theory about all this hot climate maturation. It's this is purely not scientific, although I think there are elements of science that I've slowly dragged into it over time. But it comes down to like like angel share and evaporation in different climates and how like in Scotland you lose more um, alcohol, or presumably because the water is or the air is humid, it can't take as much water from the cask. Whereas in places like Kentucky, you lose more uh, water because it's so dry in the summer and so hot. Um, alcohol probably burns off at a more consistent rate. Like there's probably a chemical scientific number that you can uh, quantify the rate at which alcohol will dissipate under certain conditions. Whereas water is climate induced, like climate controls your, your rate of, of loss of water. And I, you know, you're probably not wrong on that because looking back on it, even the best Cavalans I've had, and they're all cast strength, they're all warm. And of course they're going to be warm because they're four to seven, or maybe if you're lucky, nine-year-old whiskeys at mid fifties alcohol. And if that's the case, I mean, the old school way that distilleries made up for maybe not having the best hard or middle cut, was time. You leave it in the barrel, time polishes the rough edges of the spirit. Cavalan doesn't have as much luxury of time, partly due to their climate and their loss rate, but, you know, and they do have a small middle cut, but it could be that that's you, your palate picking up some of those more volatile edges that yeah, you can't absolutely. rush, that don't disappear in a hurry. Yeah. Like, having, know, um, having sat through like about a billion Michter's tasting, some of them with Andrea, who, of mm -hmm. course, Andrea is like the chemical engineer that mm -hmm. probably is like kind of the secret to some of their kind of goofy and, and kind of off kilter practices. You know, she's talked in depth on on some of these presentations before about like specifically that chemical that gives you that like peppery twang on the back of your palate when you swallow whiskey. Mm -hmm. And obviously bourbon has a lot of that. And I, I forget the, the chemical name of that compound. Um, someone's going to probably put it in the chat. Maybe not. I mean, it's a little bit weird, but like basically like all the things they do there are specifically targeted at getting rid of that one specific element. Hmm. So like when they say custom filtration, like a lot of people are like, what they're filtering. Yeah. They're, they're actually like trying to literally filter like one molecule out of the whiskey. That's well, funny. I mean, it's again, that might explain why Michter's is still, and I've said this many times, my favorite bourbon. Um, and I'm not Yeah. Cause it, it drinks more like scotch on the finish. Yeah, it's the but uh, what I noticed is like that that reminds me of like like bourbon tends to have that on the finish too, right? Where it's like the alcohol feels higher than it is because you get that like peppery twang mm -hmm. from like and that clearly is coming from the wood. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Um, I mean, this is clearly Sherry. Yeah. <laughs> but the funny thing is, like, I know where you're, it reminds me of that, like, sugary, nutty, spicy character in some bourbons. So, I mean, this has got to be an American oak season sherry. Well, I was going to say, it's it's got to be an American oak cask by the flavor profile. It has to be. But but then. But maybe not. <laughs> but no, but no, but I think, but the point is, like, so are the vast majority of sherry seasoned casks anyway. Mm -hmm. The majority yes. of them are American oak. So. Yeah. Uh, Jason, if you missed the picture of this one, I will put it up again. I think I shared it, but if I didn't, um, here you go. Put it back up for a moment. The other thing I can do is I can put the links to each of these in the chat. Um, I've not been doing that as we go, but I can do that. Do you explain how to um, read the Kavalin Solist codes? I think some people might appreciate that. Um, you know what, James? I got to be totally honest with you. I don't know how to do it. Okay, I'll, uh, the link I'll and ask him to do it. Do you do you have the do you have the magic key there? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. You do? Yeah. What's the magic trick? So um, the go year ahead. is the big thing, right? So you can see the year of distillation right after the letter. So R so fifteen. This was distilled in fifteen. So this one would have been bottled at eight years old. Yeah. And it even but, breaks yeah, it down to like other. year, month, day. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the back of uh, the bottling, like the the bottling date is the exact same. Letter, year, month, day. Hmm. Yeah. The Vina Barrique that we had at Banff was 10 years. They had a, they have a, apparently there's a video that explains how to do all this and I'm sure I could have figured it out with a minute's worth of work, but uh, yeah, uh, it is kind of funny. I know I don't, it's harmony. It's, it's funny you say that because you're right. Like the the fill date is is on there, but yeah. then they stamp the bottling date in yeah. right, like the little laser etch. Yeah, I know it's it's a weird combination, but at least you have that information. Because mm -hmm. yeah. with Kavlin, especially, like the difference between three and five and ten, like that sometimes says a lot. Mm -hmm. Especially because they're not putting age statements on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Kevin's asking, and the letter is the cask type? Yes, yeah. that's correct. So that peated one you had, that was a peated one. Yeah, it's virgin oak, I believe. R is virgin oak, I believe. Okay. Yeah. All right. The Vino Bariques are all W's for wine cask. Yeah. Well, let's move on to Aaron. Um, this is our 13th Aaron single cask, and in parentheses, 16th if you count two shared bottlings we did with a whiskey club over the years. Um, it is by, a, not actually only by one, one digit, the distillery we've bottled more than any other thus far. Though I suppose if we were to count Gordon McPhail as a distillery, Gordon McPhail might be the winner, but I don't know. Maybe that that's a different that's a different I'm trying, team. Andrew. I'm really trying. Well, no, no, but James, I like if you think about it, like so just in the last few years, there's been like six, I think, two two on the way. And previously I've done four Kalilas plus Glenn Grant 66. And a 1960 Strath Isla. So, like, that's got to be at least 15. There's got to be at least 15 KWM Gordon McPhail casks historically, not including Ben Romick. So, so what's but, the other distillery that's out bottled Aaron? No, there's one that's one digit behind it, and it's Kill oh. Holman. Kill okay, Holman that's what number I two. So, but that's three whiskeys from now. Um, back to the Aaron uh, 2013 vintage cask 930. Um, this is an unusual one for us. It's the first sherry butt we've ever had. Every other Aaron sherry cast we've had till now has been a hoggy. In fact, Aaron doesn't do a lot of sherry butts, and there's a number of reasons for that. The most common sense of which is storage. Uh, sherry butts are a lot harder to store and take up more space than hoggies do. They're also harder to move around. But I think there's one other reason why Aaron filled a ton of sherry hoggies historically as as opposed to butts they mature more quickly 
Butts are a much larger cask. They take longer to mature. So they're good for long maturations, which all begs the question, why would we buy, buy a young Aaron Sherry butt? And the answer is that it's great. Um, uh, the reason we bottle more Aaron's than any other distillery is that they've been incredible partners in terms of teeing us up with great casks. Um, during my retrospective tasting a couple of weeks back, we, we talked about how uh, we had a run of Aaron casks where we had, I believe it was like a 17 and 18, two 19s, two 20s, and then a 21 and 22. And each of those times we were only looking for one cask, but they sent us six incredible samples and it was hard to pick more, not to pick, you know, less than two. So we ended up picking two and all of those were from like 96, 97 and great, great casks. We wanted to go young. Uh, the last couple casks, we wanted something, you know, that, that hit a good price point for people, a bit of a crowd pleaser style of whiskey. And I think this one did that. Um, Sean and I picked this on our trip to Aaron in 2022, I believe it was. And uh, yeah, it arrived in store not too long ago. And this is at, you know, I think there's like 500 plus bottles. This is without question the biggest Aaron cast we've ever had. Um, so yeah, what are your thoughts on this, guys? Herman? Well, I'd love to ask you first before we discuss the whiskey. When you were on that trip, you yeah. actually posted pictures of cask samples of some more 96 and 97 stuff you let that go didn't you <laughs> we did for a couple of reasons i mean yeah. the, i think the 96 and 97 samples that we had that day didn't meet our expectations and the prices on them were going to be like they're going to be 600 bucks a bottle and they, yeah. they didn't they didn't make sense um but that was a weird time the guy who was with aaron at that time that was looking after us I don't think he really understood our market or he understood us. And, you know, the sad thing is, you know, Rich, you know, this is an interesting thing to talk about quickly with you, uh, James Walter. Oh God, no, no, leave that. Ah, sorry guys. The dog stripped the bolt cover off the toilet. So that's fun. Um, anyway, These, the label ideas are just coming hard and fast. Yeah. <laughs> he's, uh, he, he's, he's no quit. That's for sure. I was wondering what, what he was playing with that was making a funny noise. Anyway, um, you know, the great thing about Gordon McPhail, I'm not saying this just because you're on there, is, you know, as a generational family business, they remember people, but they remember people over time. And what I mean by that is when Richard took over for his uncle, Michael, Michael made sure that Richard knew all the people that he was supposed to know and who those people were and who they were in, in the business in terms of partners for Gordon McPhail over the years so that Richard wouldn't forget. And, you know, Aaron's been a great partner for us. And I, I think they're still a great partner for us, but it slipped for a bit because they put this guy in charge of our market that had never been out, never met us, had no idea what we did and, or that we probably were Aaron's single biggest cost customer in Canada for close to 12 years. And you know, we were begging for casks and he's kind of like, who is this guy? Why should we give them any casks? And the problem is because the person who was looking after us before didn't probably sit down with him and have that conversation. Um, so anyway, long story short, the ones we really wanted, we didn't get, but we ended up picking other ones that were great, but weren't what we were really looking for at the time. So that's how that came about. But Fortunately, okay. we're getting Louisa back, <laughs> from what I understand. So we're going to see Louisa again, who's a gem. Harmony, uh, I like it. I love, um, I love the finish on it. It goes from those like really big fruit notes, and yes, chewy oranges, uh, John, those orange peel notes, uh, to this like kind of leathery tobacco um finish it because has this really nice long and dry finish while still being quite a vibrant whiskey mm -hmm. yeah james yeah it's it's very fresh i mean i think like you look at it it looks heavily sherried you knows it it knows it's heavily sherried and then it kind of like pulls a bit of a fast one on the palate where the those sherry notes are there but it you know it's kind of spritzy like it almost mm -hmm. it reminds me a little bit of linkwood like on the palate how it just it's very lifted and like Aaron for sure has some of that same quality. Yeah. It, I, you know, it's a, 
it, even in heavily sherried whiskeys, it never seems like it's not a tiring whiskey to drink. It's not no. heavy and exhausting. And I think a lot of that comes down to how it's made. I mean, this isn't a Jim Swan distillery, but I think some of the same principles that he applied to a lot of other places were put into place here. This was a new distillery in 1996. They looked at the industry and best practice. The guy who I think got them kicked off had worked before at uh, uh, Middleton Distillery in Ireland, if I remember correctly. It was either that or may, it might have been Bushmills. And, you know, they went for long fermentation, slow distillation, putting the whiskey in good quality casks. And, you know, they played, you know, they, they were patient. They played the long game. And I think they've done a great job in terms of building a brand, but also maintaining their level of quality as that, that grant brand has grown. So. Yeah, this is a nice one. And the price is great too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't see a lot of $125 single casks anymore. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe something from Loch Lomond, but it's not going to be big sherry whiskey. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Grassy, nutty, honeyed, lovely. Um, Cool, cool. All right. Uh, any other thoughts on that before we move on to the Amroot? No. Get into the Amroot. Bueller, Bueller. Um, all right. Amroot. Let me find the Amroot, pull it up on the screen here. So this is our third cask of Amroot. Um, when we picked it, uh, Ashik was in town from Amroot. Uh, we went through a, a whole bunch of samples. And this was a funny one because... I don't think any of us at that tasting had a preconceived notion of picking a port cask. I certainly didn't. You know, I've definitely been one of those people who's um, been a port cask skeptic. You know, maybe not quite that far. I know I'm definitely a wine cask skeptic, but, you know, port casks just for me, they're really hit or miss. Um, I have a theory on why that is, but this Amber bucks that trend. Um, and it was a, it was a, it was a semi-unanimous decision. And what I mean by that was, I think there was five of us in the room. There was more than that. Was there more than that? Yeah, there was like everyone. Oh, was Marlene was there. was there and Ashik was there too. But I think there was like five, five or six staff there when we picked this. And, uh, if I remember correctly, like there was like two or three people liked one the most, two or three people liked another the most. Yeah, but one that everybody agreed on was this one, and yeah. that's how we ended up picking it. Yeah, and we were all all shocked that we yeah. all agreed on it. Yeah, because yeah. going into it, I'm just like, "There's no way we're going to like the port cask because that's yeah. just it's not on brand. It's not what we generally look for." Well, and, and like you said, they're so hit and miss. And then by the time you choose it to the time it's bottled, it can be something so different. Well, and um, I think it's on the back label, um, but, oh no, it says it there. You can see it on the box. That's why I wanted to put it up. 145th exclusive cask. So we were talking and I think it was partly, and I'll be honest, I think it was partly because um, Onyx had only recently taken over Amroot. And, you know, we had a really strong relationship with, with Ashik and we bottled casks before. And, uh, I think I might have been trying to impress Marlene when I said, but I mean, also Ashik to an extent that like we'd, we'd done some math because we'd been digging into it and that we'd bottled at least 145, 44 casks up to that date. And Ashik was like, what, what you mean? This is, this will be the 145th cask. And he's like, that's incredible. I want to put that on the label. And I was like, well, let me, let me be pretty confident of that. And so I, I went back and looked and, so yeah, he was really insistent on putting that, that that was our 145th cask. Now, we got this cask pretty quickly. The last two Emirate casks we got took 15 months and 18 months from the time we selected them. This one came in just under a year, which I'm going to say is pretty fast by Indian standards for us to get it. Um, but even then, we bottled at least a dozen casks that have arrived. So yes, it might have been the 145th we selected. Selected. We're, we're, we've got to be close to one, getting close to 160 now. And so. you should make a master document. Yeah, I know. It, it's definitely, I kind of have that. It's called our website because our website right. 
has a record of every KWM cask, but I'm convinced it's missing a few. So yeah, I've got it. Well, it's got to be one of the like 10 people that work for you that could get on this task in like a January slow day. It's a good point. It's a good point. We'll, uh, Harmony. I'm not volunteering you, Harmony. No, that's okay. Andrew <laughs> would never let anyone else do this digging. <laughs> no, I, I, it. <laughs> I do, but I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't, J James is probably right. Cause if I leave this task to myself, it'll never get done. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, Harmony, I think can be project manager, but we'll figure out somebody else to sit down and scroll through lines of text. Cause that seems like a better use of time. Um, anyway, this is a, this is an Ambercast. Now, interestingly, Evan and I were tasting this last or for the advent calendar the other night, and he said he thought it was peated. And I'm curious to know whether you guys think this is peated or not, because I, if there's peat, it's very faint to me. I'm not getting much. I thought there was some peat in here. Um, I also joked that it could be the funky Indian water, although I know they're using like clean purified water. Well, even if they're not, remember fermentation and distillation is going to kill it. Right. Right. So yeah, Kevin's saying no peat. Um, Adam is saying I do get that peat like flavor. James, you want to weigh in on this? Do you think there's peat on here? I mean, I I, I don't know. My my gut would be not. I, I understand that it yeah, it has, you know, I yeah. If if you really put my gun a uh, gun to my head, I would say no. Yeah. I mean, it's just the, one, port. the one technical reason why I think we can safely it's say this is every other time it's been a peated port pipe, they labeled it as a peated port. And I think that's kind of a stylistic thing they do. But to me, I can see why people might say that because there is an earthy, almost like a faint gunpowdery smoke note in there. And it's not sulfur, but yeah, it's, it's almost not sulfur. smoke either. What's that? Yeah, it's like almost sulfur, which. Yeah. yeah, there's just something very, but it's not even matchstick. It's not that. It's something slightly, I don't know, maybe it's intense. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I love, I love the mix of chocolate and spice in this. Um, this is also like over nine years of age and put in perspective, the first greedy angels release was 10 was eight years old. So this is older than the first greedy angels release they ever put out there. And how and much was that bottle? 400 at the time, I think three or 400. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the crazy thing about this though, is if you get past that port, it is definitely going tropical. Like oh, those tropical tones are in there. And we go back to like effective aging, hot climate maturation, nine nine years of age. Like where where does that put us in Scotch territory? Like late twenties in terms of. Um, the last quick thing I want to say is relates to the alcohol on this. This is not cast strength. This has been diluted to sixty percent. <laughs> yeah. Uh oh. Now, what's that? I said, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, well, no, but, but there's there's a reason for that, and you will almost never see amroot bottlings <laughs> above sixty percent. And the reason for it is, if they do that, they have to pay punitive excise duties, like ridiculous. It puts it into a whole other realm, excise duties. So they almost never bottle anything above sixty percent because the Indian government would would basically pillage them with taxes. I would be curious just to know what the price on the on it would have been if it had been natural cast, right? You know what? I, it's a good question. I'm more interested to know what the, the ABV was before they yeah. did it down to 60. Oh, yeah. Um, like that was yeah, part of was the question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Who knows? But uh, anyway, there's like a lot of fruit in there, chocolate, spices, tobacco, and wine gums, sort of tropical and tootsie tootsie rolls. rolls, dried yeah. strawberry, mm -hmm. dried strawberry, good call. Fruit leather, yeah, yeah, yeah. It tastes like my kids' fruit leathers. It totally yeah. does. Yeah. So, it does. <laughs> one thing I think that's tied all three amroot casks we've bottled over time, and I, I think I've got one of them here. Yeah, I've got. Uh, 
This is an unpeated virgin oak cask we did. Again, it's 60% way back when. I mean, this one is like cola cubes. It's it's insane. Um, that was the first, I think this was the first amber cask we ever bottled. That was 2016. Around 2018, we did a jaggery rum cask. And at the time, Asha like selected it for us. We agreed it was awesome. We bottled it. It was the, the only jaggery rum cast they'd ever done. Jaggery rum is a type of rum made in India that involves, like you basically ball up molasses before you ferment it, um, which was a really cool thing to do. So it's our third Amrut. Um, we're thrilled to have it. I think it's another great cast. It is our first ever port cask. Um, whether there'll be another, you know, I, I've learned to never say never because I'll end up putting my foot in my mouth and having to, Get some ketchup and mustard out. I just I you, wish you, the you cask know. wholesalers would give us more information about mm -hmm. these casks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What type of port? How old was the port? Like, just tell us. Well, James, and, and sorry, Harmony, I think you had a point to make too. Yeah, sorry, I cut you off, Harmony. Where, where were you before I follow up on what James said? What were you going to say? I said your foot in, in your mouth would be a good label. Yeah, that is the hey, we are open to all ideas and I like it. Um, but anyway, uh, and it's it doesn't always have to be about me. It's just I don't have a problem making fun of myself. So I wouldn't want to put other customers in the way, um, you know. Well, you could have like employees. you with your foot in your mouth yeah. and then the backs of the KWM team, their head, the back of their head. So you don't have to pay for faces at a picnic table with ketchup and mustard. There yeah. you go. Putting it in a bottle. <laughs> yeah. Um, James, to your point about port. I would love to know too, because um, I don't know if you've been in a tasting where I told the story, but I went to uh, um, Portugal and did the Duro with uh, Fonseca, Taylor Flaggate a bunch of years ago and Croft. And I asked at all of the Quintas, I said, do you sell any of your casts to the whiskey industry? And they all looked at me and said, why would we do that? Um, no. I said, well, where are all these port casts coming from? And they said, oh, we don't know because they don't replace their casts. They don't sell casks. They, yeah. they want what they call dead wood. They want wood that's going to give no character to the wine, that's not going to impart any flavor. And if a cask is leaking, they don't replace the cask. They figure out which stave is leaking and they replace the stave. And Yeah, uh, so you know as well as I do that almost every country in the Northern Hemisphere is making inexpensive ports for grocery stores. Right. And who knows? what qualifies as a port cask. Um, maybe these are some of those tawnies coming out of Australia. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, those age for like 80 years. Yeah. Uh, all right, we're on to the Kill Holman. Uh, the last whiskey before we do our speed round. Um, this is a cask that was uh, offered to us by Anthony Wills of Kill Holman to help me mark my 20th anniversary in the whiskey industry, which was last month. Um, really kind of him because I think he knows that uh, the 100% Isla is my favorite style of Kilholman. Um, and also it's a 10 year old. Um, now they obviously didn't have whiskey back in uh, 2003 when I first got started, but uh, you know, it, it's really cool to be able to to bottle 100% Isla 10 year old for the second time. And he picked a gorgeous cask for us. So I'm just gonna pull it up on our website if my website would just let me, I don't know why it's not letting me pull up the bottling, but I'll have it for you in just a minute. Um, Harmony, do you wanna kick us off on the nose with this one? What yeah. you get? Here we go. It's delicious. Uh, I just love the that like sweet peat. Um, I don't know. It's a smoky. It's sweet. Uh, you still get lots of fruit on this, uh, mm -hmm. even on the nose. Like a lot of people assume, if it's peated, you're just gonna get punched with smoke and and peat, but you don't. There's so much going on. Uh, it's That's like fruity and malty, and I really love it. It just makes me thirsty just smelling it. I think this is how we know I do have a bit of COVID nose right now because I know what this is supposed to smell like. Like it's mm -hmm. supposed to be decadent and malty with like citrus and smoke and I'm not getting very much of that. So my nose is definitely not getting 
everything right now. I'm finding this quite shy, but I think that's what I love about these bourbon cast Kilholmans, but especially the 100% Islas, is that nice balance of the sweet fruit, smoke, uh, salt, all those elements coming together because the peat is not over the top and it's not a dominant aroma. James, you want to toss Yeah, down? I mean, this, this is such like a sophisticated expression of Isla. Like it has that brine, um, like those, it's like, it's almost vegetal. Like it almost veers into like the weirdness of, you know, the range of peat spectrum that we expect from Isla whiskeys. But yet it's like, it's in such an elegant, well manicured package. Um, yeah, it's just, I don't think like even Kalila, I think struggles to do this as at this level. Like, I just love it. It's great. Yeah. So I've talked about this before and Harmony just alerted us her battery might die. So if she disappears, she's just Batmaning on us. And it's a, it's a good move. I pull that move many times when I want to go home and don't feel like saying goodbye. So if it happens, <laughs> we're good. I just uh, picture Harmony sitting cross-legged on the ground by the, by the plug in the wall. What's, your, what's that harmony? I said you've said this about me twice now that it's a good move. No, uh, like I actually move. I actually easy. often do this when I'm out drinking with people. It's kind of like George Costanza's, like, you know, you want to leave on a high note. And it's a combination of that and like being like, you know, you want to leave people wanting more. So if you say goodbye, you, instead you want the mystery of like, hey, did anyone see Andrew leave? But then also you don't have to go around and say goodbye to everybody. You just discreetly, when no one's looking, pull up sticks. You make sure you clear your tab, but you pull up sticks. It's a good move. Um, I, I love 100% Isla, and I love 100% Isla because it's floor malted and it's inconsistent. And I think there's elements of character and flavor that are introduced in a inefficient, inconsistent process like floor malting that you just can't equate for. Um, because it's not peated to the same level as the other Kilhomans, I think it allows the fruitiness of the spirit to really shine through too. And 10 years, like a Anthony had great advice from, from, from Jim Swan, but also, and I, I forget the lovely gentleman's name now, the distillery manager who was originally at Bunahaven, who, who sadly passed away a few years back, but he had a great distillery manager for a long time that like had a lot of experience. They took these new ideas old tradition and they made great whiskey from it and it's it's touching to me that we get something like this that is as good as it is and that's teed up for us by companies that are that like working with us so um i've i said this in an instagram post i think this is where maybe i'll just quickly say this um and then we'll go back through the whiskeys is that uh you know i don't get to do what I do for 20 years and get to where I am without other people, whether it's coworkers, agents, distillers, customers, um, helping us get to where we are, encouraging our enthusiasm, supporting our ideas, even when they're crazy. And so, yeah, it's a treat to get to bottle this and call it my 20th anniversary bottling and have it be as good as it is. And thank you to everybody for that. So. Andrew. 20 more years and now harmony i'm going to make you host in batman i'm out um <laughs> no uh james did you have anything you wanted to say about this whiskey yeah i know again just it's it's a lovely expression of 100 percent isla you know very elegant lots of brine lots of lemon yeah I love and the lemon. uh yeah it's just doesn't need any more age it's just perfect Yes. Uh, Matteo asking, what is the modern equivalent? So most distilleries do what's called a, um, they use commercial maltings plants and they can be drum maltings. Um, there's, a, I think some salad in box still running, but these are essentially vast facilities that can do hundreds of tons at a time, as opposed to a floor maltings where maybe you can do 10 tons at a time. Um, so there's big malting plants and it's not just for whiskey, the, these maltings plants, uh, and other maltings plants are there to serve the beer industry. Like craft brewers don't malt their own barley anymore. It, it takes up too much space, takes too much time and costs too much money to pay people to do it. So, um, maltings plants, uh, are the alternative. There's only about seven distilleries in Scotland with an active malting floor, um, What's cool about the Kilhoman 100% Island, the last salient point to mention about this is that it is 
it is the only whiskey in Scotland where a hundred percent of the process and the barley is from their site, made on site, matured on site, bottled on site, and shipped out. And I know there's someone out there that's going to say, "What about Springbank local barley?" They don't own the field; it's not their own field surrounding the distillery. Uh, which is not to take away from the local barley's. They're they're frankly almost always great releases. Frustratingly so because the demand way outstrips supply. But like the Kilholman 100% barley is the most true farm to bottle whiskey in all of Scotland. So full stop. Um, are we ready to go back around the horn before Harmony's phone or PC dies? Um, so we're back to that daft mill. Okay. My nose is either drunk from two tastings or COVID and it's not functioning. Oh, it is so fruity. It's almost like juicy fruit. So fruity. Yeah. Like also the hint of the like wine gums. Yeah. Oh, man. And, and like the pineapple gummy bear. I can see the gummy bear. Yeah, pineapple, pineapple gummy bear is a great note. Mm -hmm. Is a pineapple gummy bear a thing? Like is that mm -hmm. a big is it like a is it is it like a marijuana thing? I'm just no, no, it's no. Weed or whatever, but no, it's not an edible. No, whiskey is my drug. No. Um but no, it's a real thing. I'll, next time I get gummy bears, I'll bring you some. All right. I need to try a pineapple. I mean, I'm not a big fan of like, like fresh pineapple, but that's more an ADD thing. I really can't handle the texture of it. So um, that's, that's different. Uh, all right. What about that daft mill would be, it's just not as long as I would like on the finish, but yeah, I mean, that's so much up front. Yeah. If you, if you are not a big drinker and you just want to enjoy holding it and smelling it, in the occasional sip, this is definitely a great choice. And 46% good drinking strength. Uh, what? All right. Kevin. 24 year. Let's go to Hawaii. Well, there's a new flavor that's come out. It's it's very spearminty. Hmm. I hope people don't take that as like, oh, I forgot to brush my teeth. I'm just going to eat these new gummy bears. Well, I mean, what other things are spearmint gum? You can see a little bit of spearmint gum perhaps on there. Yeah. Maybe a bit of juicy fruit. But yeah, I think my my palate is definitely starting to, to wander here. Two tastings in and COVID recovery and all. Still digging that space side. What about the Craig Yilicky? How's that showing? Man, my nose is gone. The yeah, nose? It smells corked at first. Yeah. Every time. That's great galaxy for you. You know what? This is the first whiskey I had to test my palate after um, I felt I was well enough from COVID because Evan and I had the <laughs> whiskey calendar tasting the other night. And it was great then. It's still great now. Um, uh, I did get a weird question about this Craig Galecki label. Um, yeah. Geez. I actually was showing somebody the label and I was like, there's Walter, there's his little cocktail with the bone in it. And she was like, wait, is it going to taste like dog bones? <laughs> no, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I was like, well, I mean, maybe. <laughs> so do you lie to the customer at that point when you know it does taste a tiny bit like dog bones? Well, I said I've never had a dog bone, but I won't tell you it doesn't if you get that. <laughs> well, speaking of You Walter never just took a little nibble, Harmony, just out of curiosity? <laughs> no. You've never tried dog bone, like milk no. bone? Oh, I've never you just ate need to have more beers. It's like, it's just like I've had every pet. Really dry cracker, like a really bland dry cracker. Yeah, I know. So Walter won't eat milk bones; he spits them out. Speaking of which, he's he's trying to get my attention. So his his ADD is triggered here. But back to the Craig Illichy, Like my palate is not at its best right now, but to me. This one is firing way more flavor sensors than the, the, the first two for me. Yeah, yeah. it's funny that that boutique I thought was the most fruity of these first three on the first pass. And on the second pass, number one and three are, are way more fruity. Yeah. Well, and then you go to four and it's even more fruity than three. Oh, let's see. In good my segue. opinion. Good segue, Harmony, way to keep us on track. Mm. Hardtack sea biscuits. <clears throat> Oh, 
Yeah, the Glen Topris does have a minerally kind of um mm -hmm. like you would think that it was closer to the ocean based on how this yeah. cask is showing. Yeah. It feels to me like it's the whole like the whiskey's wrapped in a package of parchment paper. It's like it's been wrapped up. Yeah, there's like a sprinkle of salt on there, like waxy salt and mm -hmm. and there's still this like grassiness that comes through more on this on the finish than the original like Krigalki grassiness for me. Mm -hmm. Some of the alcohol blowing off in the glass goes a long ways. It mm -hmm. does. Yeah. Well, because uh, you were saying that was it the 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 Cavalan drinks pretty hot, mm -hmm. and the Craig Eliki is less, and it's or higher, and it was no. They're both are almost the same. They're within they're within one percent of each other. So, um, right. well, there was a different was, one. But I think James was referring to the Glen Talkers, which was yeah, yeah, yeah. and it. Sure. You're right. They're like totally switched. But at least at that time. Speaking of the Cavalan, which actually, interestingly, from the first past is the most empty of my glasses. <laughs> well, something that needs to be said about, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of obsessive about this, but like the Cavalan and the Amroot, you owe it to yourself to have a bottle like this that is half open for like at least a year. Right. Because they go to some like really cool places like that really aggressive character that they can have when you crack them. Like once that fades away, they're just... They go to this new place that I think everyone should get to experience. Mm -hmm. You kind of get a hint of that when it's been in the glass like this for an hour. Yep. Wait, you're saying that my bottles should last longer than a year? No, there's, this is a safe place, Harmony. There's no judgment here. You're in the, you're in the trust tree or whatever it's called. Uh -huh. In Banff, uh -huh. they had a tasting, like a master class. It was like the 101 for collectors. Mm -hmm. and it was like, how do you know you're a collector? And it was like, well, because your friend will come over and tell you you have a lot of bottles, <laughs> more than they do. And all of a sudden, you realize that you have a collection of whiskey. <laughs> and and then like whether that becomes a passion to the point where you stop opening them and realize that there might be an investment aspect to your collection that's another thing that's on you uh but typically that investment won't return upon itself for a couple of years and i was like wait a minute <laughs> i mean i have a hundred open bottles they don't last very long <laughs> like people come over they drink you take them home they go like yeah. i don't know if i have, have any bottles on my bar that have been open longer than a year mm. but that's okay I have on... some in my closet that have been there for dec like a decade, but oh yeah. Well, <laughs> who doesn't who doesn't have closet whiskey? Um the bathtub anyway. whiskey, that's the stuff that goes the quickest. Which one? The three or four that I keep in my bathroom. Oh. For my bathtubs. Dave's got four <laughs> in a I used bubble to... <laughs> bath and I need a refill and I'm not getting out. <laughs> oh. Before we moved, and most of my collection has not even been moved into the home yet, but uh, yeah, I, there was hiding places. We don't even need to get into this. It's 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 a sickness, but a well-intentioned one that doesn't harm anybody. So what can you do? Um, the Cavalan's great. The Aaron's great. I think we got to keep this speed round going. We're, we're losing some traction here. Sorry, guys. Yeah, the Aaron's taking on a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of baking spice notes. It's mm -hmm. a little bit doughy. It is doughy. I mean, it it's coming across now as very youthful. Like it's yes. not in a bad way, but it's it feels like the most youthful of all the whiskeys in the lineup tonight. Um, well, maybe spin it this way that that Cavalan, which you're saying, if you do the math on, drinks like it's in its late twenties. The Aaron side by side really makes the Cavalan seem older, right? It does. Yeah, it's a it's a good point. Um, Harmony, comments on the air before we move on to the uh, the Amrit? No, it's good. It's great. I like it. Okay. It's good. Man, the Amrit is like going to a fancy restaurant. They're serving you elk with like a blueberry reduction. Yeah. Um, a blueberry port reduction. And there's definitely some blood oozing out of the elk into the reduction. Nice. 
And that's what the COVID knows. Um, yeah, I mean, this whiskey is really big, but holy cow, is it complex? Yeah. Like just layers upon layers upon layers. It's almost too much. Yeah. There's a lot. It's, and I've it's, added it's, water to it just for fun, like three or four drops, and it's still changing. But the, the funny thing is, and I'm going to go back, I'm going to use the Craig Illichy as a counterpoint to this, because I think that Craig Illichy is quite complex as well, too. But I think it's sessionable. This Amroot, like I could have a glass of it and they'd be like, all right, that's a, that's enough of that for tonight. I'm on to something else now. Like too much would be too much. Yeah, I got to say too, like you posted that picture of that older Glendronic and I get it. Those have their own thing, but sometimes they can kind of go in this direction. Yeah, This is, this is a much more affordable version to have that type of experience. Yeah. Well, I used to love doing them. We used to do those Glendronic verticals where we would do seven or nine yeah. vintages of Glendronic in a row. I think we bottled like 50 different casts of Glendronic over seven years. But like they were so similar. I mean, even when they were different, they were so similar that it was like, you, you can't, like, what are you going to say? Like, well, this one's spicier than the last one. Like they're they're just, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a fun experience, but it's like it's the kind of whiskey that you you have a dram of every once in a while, but it's not your everyday dram, yeah. which is not to say it's not special or maybe better, but it's just it's not an everyday dram. Armini, you hinted at this about how people view Amrit, and I think it's so true. And I this is actually something I remember Jay Wheelock saying is that people do really kind of assume that like there's like a slow moving dirty river that has like bodies in it that is being used as the water source for Amroot. Like people just yeah. think that they just do oh, not they everybody, do. but people definitely do. Absolutely. They do. Like my father went to India for work for 10 days. And when he came back, he had more photos and I, I thought it was so inappropriate, but he was shocked of people hand digging holes on the beach and like dozens of people looking out at the ocean doing their business on the beach every morning because that's the bathroom mm -hmm. or walking down the street and like the top the street just changing color and he would stop and this lady would beat him up and say you're in my kitchen you're in my bathroom get out of my house and he's like i'm on the sidewalk I thought uh, yeah. but it's just so overpopulated that you would think that everything all the industrial aspects of that country are just mm -hmm. not well, the irony of that is is that if you've been to Glendronic like their water source actually is kind of funky <laughs> probably funkier than Amber's yeah. <laughs> like it's slow moving there's a lot of organic matter in it yeah. which definitely I think translates to the whiskey but yeah <laughs> I don't know well, sadly, I like I, what I said that. So, <laughs> sadly, that whiskey is not what it used to be. Um, like, really, not what it used to be. But that's a different story. I mean, we <laughs> could we could delve into topics such as have Have you seen the burning gas on the Ganges? And no, <laughs> I, I had to Google what that was. I didn't even know what that reference was. I don't have any idea, but it. I mean, the real the reality is. You're right. And whether it's fair that people have that stereotype or not, it's like those four British guys getting mad thinking I'd trick them with Cavalan. Like, right. You know, and it's the one of the sad reality well, it's one of the sad realities of whiskey. You can there's people who won't buy independent bottlings because they're yeah. not official. Even if they're <laughs> better and they cost less money. They it doesn't matter. You can't wrap their head around it. I've I've long since given up trying to win that fight. I mean, that's not our customers, so we don't. I almost got into a physical fight with a guy at our last festival because he walked up to my table and said, "I hate independent bottlings. They're all terrible. What do you have?" I said, "Nothing. <laughs> I have nothing for you." Harmony, I just pitched. Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. No, no, go ahead, James. I was gonna say I just pictured Harmony like clubbing a customer over the head with the dummy bottle of Glenlivet eighty year old. Yeah, yeah, I would. I, yeah, Please probably, film that, Andrew, if she does it. would be a good idea, but... That would outdo um, uh, Mike's bottle toss photo. It probably oh would. My God. Um, I mean, to literally be <laughs> clobbering him with a replica of the oldest independent bottling ever. 
Um, yeah, no, I like I tried to change his mind and I poured him a lot of stuff, but he enjoyed like just giving me the gears on it. And his son and wife came back later and apologized. So like, sorry about him. Like he just doesn't get it. I'm like, no, that's fine. But you have to be open minded. Otherwise, what's the point of coming to something like this? Back, if you're back in the be- day, I would have if a customer had said that to me, I'd been like, I think you're at the wrong store. I think you're looking for Willow Park. So <laughs> That's a bit of an inside. That's a bit of an inside joke. Oh, <laughs> Alberta on Alberta crime right now. <laughs> but I, but I digress. I mean, just to quickly round off on that point though, because it's funny, but it it's something that to me has become meaningful. Is the reason why like Kensington Wine Market went so deep in independent into independent ballings, and especially companies like Gordon McPhail was because. You know, other people were hogging McAllen, Glenlivet, and Diageo and and Glenfiddich. And you know what? Thank God they were, because all these brands that were the sideshow at one point in time, at least to me now, are in many cases the most interesting players in the game. So uh, you know, there was a frustration at one point when like couldn't get the time of day from the McAllen folks, but I mean, good luck to them selling McAllen 25 at six grand a bottle now. Like, I don't know how that's going to work in the long run. I suspect not well, but, you know. Especially that's... when every I feel like most people who are going to buy that, I would say like 95 of them are all going to turn around and be like, I'm going to invest this later. And then they're all going to show up in the secondary market at the same time and they're not going to get anything for it. Possibly. <laughs> anyway, I could use this time to mention there's a 25-year-old Spay Mall McAllen shortly coming in. The oh, day. nice. Yeah. Well, but Spain I just want to different. point out I mean, that our speed round sort of got stuck in the mud. I mean, uh, Kilhoman is between great. Amrud and Kilhoman. Um, incidentally, the Kilhoman is still showing really well. It's like if you could somehow infuse like subtle peat smoke into vanilla crave cupcakes from just down the street okay. from us. Yeah. That would be that would be what I'm getting right now. I feel like there's a chance that I would guess that's an agave spirit in the mm. right scenario. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I feel like we could make that happen somehow. All right. I'm firing up the poll, I think, if I haven't created it. He, he's got several polls here. I better make sure I pick the right one. Oh, um, I don't think we have a poll. That's my favorite change during the speed round. So did it. <laughs> there is no poll tonight. Instead oh. of a poll... Uh, why don't you fire into the chat your two favorite whiskeys? What was your first favorite and what was your second favorite? Or just your Old two school. favorite period. Uh, yeah. I suppose it doesn't matter. And then while you're doing that, uh, I'll get uh, James and Harmony to chime in with their favorites tonight. Guys, I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you both have three favorites. What were your three favorites from tonight's tasting? Okay, I think I'm ready. So uh, Harmony's still got her nose in the glass. So um, I'm going to stick with my original, which was the uh, the Boutique Space Side 24. I mean, that is just like exactly what I'm all about with whiskey. I mean, that just nails it for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought the Craig Yellicky had inched past it, but there's just a little bit of a rough edge on the finish of the Craig Yellicky that puts it behind mm-hmm. the Boutique, I've... even though I think it's more complex on the nose. And um, yeah, number three. You know what? I do like getting a paycheck, and I'm going to go with a Glenn Talkers as my number one. Oh, <laughs> I like that move. I like that move. It was classy, but justified. So well done. Well That's done. taking price into account, too, right? I mean. Yeah, <laughs> you have to. It's, it's so, um, like that's an okay. unbelievable deal. It's hard to pick an order, which is like one, two, or three. Okay. But the three that I liked the most would be... The Kilhoman, mm-hmm. the Glen Talkers, and the Amroot. I don't know if I have the patience to appreciate the Amroot. I wish I did, but every time I know it, it's different, and I like that. Yeah. yeah. Harmony, I'm going to leave a bottle of that open for a year and then send you a vial. Oh my God. <laughs> sure. It's called science, ladies and gentlemen. Science. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, this is a very okay. tough. The Daphne kind of is still appealing for me to pick three from, um, especially because two of them have got a personal collect connection, not just the store. Um, you Your know, dog's what? looking at you right now. Yeah. What's that? Walter's looking at you like, don't you dare choose the wrong one. Well, he, he was <laughs> here just a second ago. Um, but to be honest, and, and this is based on, I have open bottles of almost all of these in my house, and I've been drinking the most of the Craig Illichie, So it can't be anything but the Craig Illichie for number one. Um, number two is the Kilhoman. I just, I love the profile of it. Ah. I really want Amrut to be my number three, but it can't. I actually, I, that Boutique Space Side is just so crazy fruity and spirit driven for me that like it, it edges it out. But the Amrut is honorable mention because man, that it, there's just so many layers to it. I think the I challenge think is like, good. it would take me five years to finish a bottle of that because <laughs> maybe every two months I'd want to drip. Can I also throw in Cavalan? I really like this Cavalan. Cavalan's great too. Um, quickly running through people's results. What have we got here? Their, their picks. We've got Amrud and the Boutique Space Side. We've got Cavalan, Daft Mill, Craig Illichie, Kilholman, Craig Illichie, Daft Mill, Kilholman, Kilholman, Craig Illichie, with in parentheses, Cavalan Close. Then we've got Kilholman. Number two is the Aaron, uh, but number one for value. Kilholman, Amrud, Kilholman, Boutique. I'm hearing a lot of kill home in here. I have to say, kill home in is for the one. Uh, Craig Illichie is two. Craig Illichie. Wow, that's it's interesting to see that. I think if we had a poll scientifically, I think we would say kill home in Craig Illichie, Amber Boutique, I think is what I heard there. Something yeah, like that, which is not far off from if you averaged all of our picks, was probably somewhere in there too. Um, it was hard to choose because I think they were all good and there's a time and a place for all of them. Well, that's why we bottled them. And I think maybe this is a, a good closing point for me to make, which is um, if you've never heard the rationale for how the store chooses casks and how it got started and how it is that we're at a point where we've bottled way more casks than probably most of our competitors combined is it started off with me picking casks for the store and it wasn't my money. And I needed to make sure they sold or Nancy wouldn't let me buy more casks. So I had to be really confident. And I often drove a hard bargain. And over time, staff have become involved. At one point, customers were involved. And even after I took over the business, we kind of always retained that same aesthetic that it had to be something good and it had to be good value or we couldn't put our name on it. And over time, I've come to know that customers trust that. And maybe an individual cask might not be your favorite style, but you know that if we put our branding on it, we're not doing it just to make a quick buck, that we're doing it because it's a product we believe in. And um, we know that that sort of trust is fragile because if we break it, you know, you won't trust it again. So we definitely take that to heart when we choose. And uh, fortunately, we've got great partners like Authentic and Gordon McPhail, Aaron, Kilholman, uh boutique you know others that that have allowed us to do this over the years because it's become an important part of our business um james i want to say a big thank you to you you were a unintended you know co-pilot on this this adventure tonight you were like our uh our navigator back in the days when you needed a navigator in an airplane who knew yeah i think we avoided the conflict of interest tonight so thank you for having me uh, you dude, you're you're a whiskey nerd at heart. We know that, and that's why we were happy to have you on board. Harmony, thank you very much as always. There was rumors of one or two other staff coming, but uh, we got Harmony, so we were good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, like, we didn't need anybody else. Is my point. Sorry if that didn't come across as elegantly. You got to have a different mix every time, Andrew. <laughs> you do have to have a different. Yeah, you do have to have a different mix, and. Uh, um, Harmony does bring a very different perspective to things, which is awesome. And we, we love it. So come on, Dad Bellamy. I meant that as a compliment. It just didn't yeah. sound the way I thought it. And okay. this is my second tasting tonight. So so anyway. Oh, so you're drunk. Oh, you're forgiven. Oh my goodness. I'm so oh. sorry, Andrew. 
But uh, big thank you to everybody who took part tonight. Thanks for those of you who chimed in. And uh, uh, <laughs> Carmi keeps having in line. I love that comment. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, no Batmaning tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us. Nice seeing you. I know we got Cam as far away as Quebec and people in Alberta, Ontario, and BC. Uh, appreciate seeing you guys all on here tonight. If we don't see you at a tasting before, have a happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. If we do, we'll chat again when we see you next. So have a great night, everybody. Good night. Good night.